What's up? I'm here to talk about my procedural generation of my dungeon map. Um, the way that this works is it essentially, and this is actually a pretty small dungeon, but what it, what it does is it takes three tile maps and it generates a ground tile map first. So it generates the area where my character can actually walk. And then after the fact, I generate some walls and some pit where the, the character can't actually walk just for aesthetic feel. But in reality, the only thing that's really necessary to understand about this generation is the, the ground generation. And I just use a composite collider and tile map collider to give myself some barriers where my character can't walk. So um, the way that this works is it starts off by first I map all of the objects that I'm going to need for the generation. So I map my tile sets, so my, my walls, my pit, and my ground. And then I map all three maps. I actually don't use a player at all. Um, I have that there for potential to spawn the player in a random room, or if I wanted to set the map to generate around the player dynamically, I could use that in the future, but that's not used yet. And then I have four variables that I've defined as deviation rate, room rate, max route length, and max routes. I can show you what those do right now if you like. Um, if I set my max route length to say 200, it's going to take a little bit longer to generate, but what will end up happening is it'll be a much longer route. So a much longer dungeon or a much bigger dungeon. What what max route length says, it says that's the, the furthest distance I'm willing to allow my route to go, or I'm going to allow my route to stretch before my player hits the end. So what this says is it's going to be 200 3 by 3 rooms or 3 by 3 tiles that my character is going to have to walk through before he hits the end of the route. So if you actually map that out to, to the actual tile map counts, it's going to be 600 tiles total my character is going to have to walk across to hit the end of the dungeon. And if you were to count this manually, you would see that you know at this tip, that's, two, that's 200 route lengths or 600 total tiles to get there. Uh, and, and the reason I do that is if I don't limit that, um, what could end up happening is, especially with my, the current logic I have here, my routes could go on indefinitely. And then uh, I have room rate and deviation rate. What that means is these areas where there's bigger squares, normally a route or a, a, a hallway is only three by three. That's one square that I generate. If you see areas that's bigger than that, like this area right here, that's a room. And I have a room rate setting, a, saying that every 15, uh, every 15, I guess, three by three squares or every 15 rooms or, or chunks, I create a room. So you'll notice uh, this. So this three by three square is the initial square, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh one. And this is probably like 10th or 11th. Then I happen to roll the dice and say, hey, let's create a room right here. And it creates one using this room rate. So this just happened to be a random dot range of, and we'll get into the code in a second, but it generates this room right here um, using this room rate. So occasionally you'll see it more, more often, occasionally you'll see it uh, uh, less often depending on how your, your random number generator is doing. But you'll notice that's kind of how those rooms are generated is using this room rate. Deviation rate means how often it changes direction or how often it chooses a direction to go, I should say. So deviation rate says that every 10, uh, so normally the way that my dungeon works is it'll just make me go straight all the time until it deviates, until it changes direction. And that deviation means that it's going to spawn a new route or go in a new direction. So here, the very first square is here, second square is here, and it deviates to the right, and that's the third square. And then it deviates to the left, and that's the the fourth square, and then it goes straight, 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 deviates, straight, 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 straight. So you're going to see the majority of the time, my map is going to want to go straight because my deviation rate is set to 10, meaning it's only going to change directions once every 10 squares. But it's not entirely a true number. It's not once every 10 squares. It's really, it, it checks that three times. We'll get into that. And then the number of max routes, what that means is um, the number of separate spawned routes that I can take. So in reality here, this is probably two different routes, maybe three. It's probably like five, actually, looking at the way that this looks up here. It's just an amalgamation of nightmares. But let's just pretend it's only two separate routes. So I have one route that goes up this way, and it goes down here and all the way to the end. That's just, let's just call that one route. And the second route is up here, and it goes all the way up here and does all this nightmare stuff, and then it ends right here. There's probably two or three in here, but we're just going to call it two routes. If I don't limit this maximum number of routes here, what can happen here is if my deviation happens to say, hey, let's go left and right, meaning the one out of 10 rolled twice, uh, it rolled positive twice, then it would go left and right and it'd create a new route in one of those directions. And if I don't limit that to say 10 or 15 or whatever number I put in there, what can happen is I can end up spawning an infinite number of routes and this gets ex exponentially more painful for my computer. But let's just go into the code here now. And now that you have an underlying understanding of what, I, what, what it looks like and how it works, 
Um, it's pretty simple, to be honest. It's only 200 lines of code and most of it's initialization. But um, here's just my initialization of those values and those fields. Uh, and then let's just get into the start here. So what I do is initially I create a square with a radius of 1, which is really that 3 by 3 square. It's a point in the middle with a radius of 1, meaning all the squares around it or all the tiles around it are included. And I just generate a square. It's a quick, it's a quick uh, line. It's, just, it's a method real quick. It just, all it does is it looks at all the radius, all the tiles within a radius around it, and then sets those to the ground tile object. Um, but then we get into it. We set the previous position to there. So the way that this procedural animation works, or this procedural generation works, is you always have to have a previous direction you were on. So I, if my very first square is right here at 0, 0, there's no previous direction. The previous direction is the abyss. So what I always do is I seed my procedural generation with a first direction, which is up or straight. Uh, the way that my procedural generation works is it's, it's called straight left and right. I don't use up, down, I don't use X and Y's. The way I view it is if I were in the dungeon, and if I were walking as a human, I'm walking straight. Okay, straight is up, uh, right is right, left is left. But now if I'm walking to the right, straight is straight. Right is down, and, and left is up. Does that mean, I, I wonder if that, that's probably super confusing. But if I were this guy, if I were to move my, my personal self into his position and look straight out where he's looking, he's looking at this wall, I'm looking at his left, his right, and his straight. So that's the way that my logic works here. And the reason I do that is it saves myself a, quite a bit of logic. So you see, I say go straight, go left, and go right. It saves me the logic of having to go backwards because there's no purpose in me going backwards in the way that this procedural generation works. Because if I'm going backwards, that means I'm going to the position I was previously. So if I go straight, so this is my first square, second square. If I go backwards, I've already generated this square. There's no purpose for me to do that. I'm just going to double up on the work. If I can avoid that, it's, it's best. Now, it's still possible for me to overlap previous squares, but it's never possible for me to go backwards and reverse my work. So it saves, in a sense, it saves me twice as much computing power, or I guess it halves the amount of computing power I need because it's a combination. This isn't just, hey, go back is going to be you know a 25% increase or 30%. It's going to be literally double because now I'm compounding it with the way that the rest of this stuff works. But let's, let's get into it. So my start function, or my start method, creates a square at the very initial point, and it moves up. So the very first thing, I see it moving up, and it creates another square. And now I move into the new route. So the way that this works is I have a bunch of routes that my procedural generation can work, or my procedural generation can run. So I can create a route and move in that direction, and I can create another route and move a different direction. So I can have parallel routes, in a sense, that are pushing me in a direction, um, and it pushes the generation in that direction. So I can have a dynamic dungeon as opposed to just one straight line. I have dynamic routes that allow me to have multiple options for you to take the dungeon to the end, or maybe you'll end up in a dead end. Uh, and the way that that works is I, so you get into the new route. We won't worry about the route count or the route length just yet. Um, we say, hey, has the route been used yet? That's important here. Uh, so we'll just, we'll call that important, or we'll comment as we go. Check to see if, uh, we're initializing route used. Initialize. So we're just initializing a couple of things here. Um, so first we're saying, hey, the route has not been used yet because we're at the very beginning of the new route, um, at least the new route while loop. And then we're checking the offset. So we're checking, okay, my current x versus my previous x. So if I look at where I started, if I'm on my second tile here, my current x is 3, 0. My previous x was 0, 0. So I'm looking at actually right here is the tile. Or I think it's actually right here. This is, th this is 3, 0, and this is 0, 0. So I'm saying, hey, my current x is 3. Or, sorry, this is 0, 3, and this is 0, 0. My current x is 0. My previous x is 0. So my x offset is 0. But my y offset is 3 because I moved up 3 units. So uh, this would be 3 in that example, and this would be 0. So this would be 0 in this example. That would be 3. <coughs> and I'm setting my room size to 1. The reason why I do this is because by default, that's my hallway length or my hallway size. So my hallway size is a radius of 1. So it's 1 square with a radius of all the squares around it being set. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then I check to say, hey, should I do a room generation? By default, I'm setting my room generation to be, I think it's 10 or it's 15. So in my code here, you notice on here, I have room rate is 15. So I'm checking, hey, random range of 1 to 100. If that's less than my room rate, so 15 is 15%, um, then I'll create a room. So every 15, or 
yeah, every 15%, there's a fi or every cycle of a, a generation of a hallway or a room, there's a 15% chance that'll create a room. And that room could be anywhere from a radius of three to a radius of six. And you'll notice that here, this is, I think, a radius of five, because the center point is something like right here, and it's one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's a radius of five, all directions. And so it created a room right around this spot right here. Um, but you'll notice it doesn't happen everywhere. It happens probably one in five, one in six, uh, runs down a hallway and sometimes it doesn't happen for 10 runs um, and I can change that to be more frequent rooms or less frequent rooms or I can make everything a room but that's kind of the benefit to that value there is I'm actually checking right now should I make this a room where I'm standing uh, and then I set my previous position the reason I set my previous position is because previously my previous position was 0 0 now I'm on 0 3 my previous position is now going to be 0, 3 because I'm creating a new room. So let's actually walk me through this. So I'm on 0, 0, I move up, now I'm at 0, 3. Now I move up, I'm at 0, 6. My previous position should be 0, 3. Now I haven't generated this yet, but I want to track that previous position before I generate new rooms. So now I check, hey, should I go straight? And my deviation rate is just, um, I should actually normalize this. So this is actually 0, 1 to 100, and then I do my deviation rate as a percentage, just like I do the room rate, but I'm not right now. I'll fix that later. Uh, what I could do is the same way that I did the the uh, room range or the room check. I could do something like this, deviation rate like that. So I could do something less than or equal to the deviation rate. So I could do something like that to say, hey, there's a 10% chance of it deviating. It doesn't matter for the deviation rate though, because right now, well, for now it doesn't matter. I might as well do that for all these actually. Um, but what it's doing right now is it's saying, hey, should I go straight? And what this is saying is, hey, let's generate a random number between 1 and 100. If it's less than the deviation rate, which is 100, or if the deviation rate is 10, uh, so less than or equal to, so that means that there's a 10% chance that I'm going to choose to go straight. And if that's the case, I'm going to first check to see if the route's used. Because we're in the straight section, there's no chance the route's been used yet. This is going to be false, so we can skip this. And we're going to go straight into this. So we're going to say, hey, the new x position is my previous x position plus the offset. and and my new y position is the previous y position plus the offset. That's only going to be true in the straight direction. We'll get into those on the left and the right in just a second, because it's not always going to be the case. Uh, if I'm going straight, I want to keep going in the direction that was going. And then I generate a square at the new direction, and I say, hey, the route's been used. And the reason for that is now I know, hey, my current route has continued straight. That's my current route. If I create any new ones, those are new routes that we don't need to worry about. Um, so now let's go into the go left one. Same thing, 10% chance. Okay, we're going to go left. Now what happens, the route has been used. Let's say that we did have the route used. We're going to actually do a generate a new square at the new direction that it'll be, which would be uh, a logical check. It, it, it'll go left essentially arithmetically uh, if we're looking at the stage character left. So this guy's going straight. Left is that direction. Uh, straight is straight. And right is that direction. But if he's going to this, he's moving to the right, stage left is this direction stage straight is this direction and stage right is this direction and I'm using stage left straight and right for the purpose of a more efficient script I believe I explained that a little bit earlier um, if that's confusing to you let me know uh, but the way that it works is like here if I want to go left my previous y position plus my x offset is how you cal how you would calculate stage left arithmetically and then my x is previous x position minus my y, y offset is how I would calculate stage right arithmetically, or sorry, stage left arithmetically for my x position. And so my x and y position there are calculated, and I can generate a new square at the new position and say, hey, I use my route. So if my route had not been used, I would do this calculation. If my route had already been used, I would do the same calculation. I would generate a square at that same position, but I would spawn a new route. In, and so I would now have essentially a parallel method running within this original method. And so now you, you actually see I'm using recursion. I'm calling its parent, its own method name. I'm actually calling itself and creating a new route. So I'm not really doing parallel processing or parallel generation. It's all still sequential and linear, but uh, the, the reason why I have this route count as less than max routes is because that that's what prevents this from becoming an infinite recursion. It's, it prevents this from essentially blowing my machine up because I didn't put a limit. You need to make sure you're checking for that potential recursive nightmare. So that's why I have a maximum routes count. So if I have, hey, you know, you're on your new route, I create a new route here and I say, hey, my route count has been increased, um, which it gets increased right here. I say, hey, you know what, I'm past my max routes. 
don't generate a new route. Now on my new route uh, generation here, I don't want all of my new routes to reach the same length as my original route. They can, but I don't always want them to be. Maybe I want my new route to only be two units long instead of 50 units long. What I do there is I generate a random number between the route length that it's currently at and the maximum route length that it can go, and that's what determines the maximum route length, or the route, current route length that my new route will be on. So it'll actually say, hey, you know, say I'm five units from the maximum route length. It'll continue out five more units and then stop. It won't make my, what I'm trying to avoid here is say, um, say I generated a new route. Let's just, uh, let's kill this one and make it smaller. Let's make it like 50 and that should be pretty quick. Um, so say I generated this new route and I spawned a route in this direction and a route in that direction. I don't want them both to be the same length where they're both going to be 50 units long. Maybe I want the one on the left to only be 30 units long and the one on the right or my original route to be 50 units long. Well, in order to achieve that, that deviation or that change or that slight difference between the two, I use that random number between route length and max route length to kind of uh, randomize that and give my other routes some form of difference between the original route. It can still be the same max length, but this allows you to have that deviation. And some of this is repeated code. I really should be uh, creating a second method and extracting it to do that, but uh, this is a first pass through and uh, I'll clean that up later. And let me just copy this over again so we have some clean code again. Uh, and then here I do the same thing from a write check. I say, hey, is it less than the deviation rate? Here it's 10, so is, is it, there's a 10% chance to go right. And I say, hey, has the route been used? If yes, then I create a new route in the right direction. If not, then I uh, just say, hey, the route's being used and move it to the right. Um, and there's possible for me to say, hey, go straight, right, and left, all in the same. It's possible for me to roll the dice and get true, true, true for all three of them and spawn two new routes and continue the original route all in one. But then at the very end, I don't want my dungeon to stop if the die doesn't roll. You know, I don't want my dungeon to suddenly say, hey, you know, you didn't choose left, right, or straight, kill it right here, because what can end up happening here is it's a 10% chance to deviate. I'm gonna end up stopping in like the third square and go nowhere, and my whole dungeon is not gonna generate at all. So I say, hey, if the route hasn't been used yet, generate a new square, and then it goes back and it continues through the while loop and continues until I hit the maximum route length. I hope that kind of explained through how this uh, procedural generation works. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna post a link to my code. If you wanna take a look at it, you're welcome to. Uh, hopefully this makes sense. If you have any questions, there's anything I didn't explain well, uh, feel free to let me know and I'll, I'll try to answer those. I hope this wasn't too painfully long. It might have been. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you guys next time.